you know, uh, if you're lucky enough to get older, you come to these uh, marking points. And um, Bev said to me here a while back, you need to kind of start thinking about, uh, you know, reaching out and contacting the Social Security Service. And, and the best way to do that is to call them. And uh, so I thought, well, I've never been here before, never done this before. And so I called and got somebody. And they said, well, the best thing to do is just go online. And so I filled out this little application. When it got to the end of it, it said, and now you need to take, the, it pointed to another document, take this document by either by the, uh, the uh, Social Security office or fax it. Oh, well, I'll just, I'll just run it by there. So I called them, and uh, I got a person that answered the phone, and uh, they said, yeah, bring it by. it would be great. Good to see you you know, wait, waiting for you. So I was going down to Oklahoma City that week, and I stopped by the office on North Kelly, and man, it's a huge building, and you walk in, and the first thing that happens is you got to go through all of the metal detectors and body scans and frisks, and and uh, you get in, and you go to a kiosk, and you get a number, and then they say, go sit down. And uh, and they call your name, and uh and you sit in front of like this bulletproof glass, all of these windows. There's about 9,000 of these windows, and all are bulletproof glass. And, uh, and so when I walked in there, somebody called my name, and I didn't get permission to use their name, so I won't give their name, uh, but a colleague who was doing the same thing I was doing. And so he called my name, went over and sat down, and we were visiting. I said, how long have you been here? And he said, uh, quite a bit longer than you've been here. And, uh, and so... Uh, pretty soon they called his name and he left and and so I just waited and waited and waited. Finally they called my name and said Adrian Cole window 46 or somewhere. So back on the other side and so as I was going in my friend was coming out and I said well, how'd it go? And he said well they had to call Philadelphia and they had to transfer my records Oklahoma City, but we got it all squared away. And I said, wow, that's good. So I went and sat down in front of the window, and the lady said, well, let me see your driver's license. So I handed my driver's license to her, and she starts asking me these questions that were all on the application that I just filled out online. You know, what's your name? Duh. You know, when were you born? Where were you born? Who did you marry? What's your wife's name? Where did you marry? What's the date of your marriage? Uh, what city were you born in? Uh, you know, are you a U.S. citizen? And, and finally, I just looked at her and I said, is there a problem? Or maybe, is, is there some kind of problem? I'm not sure how I said it. But she said, yeah, they've got you classified as anomalous. I thought, man, I've never been classified anomalous before. I said, what is anomalous? She said, Whoever did this, when you turn in this application, they think you're a fraud. I said, really? I said, well, what do you do in that situation? She goes, oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, she said, sometimes these things can take, you know, a while. And I just kept thinking about this, you know, this governmental black hole that you hear about. Uh, that you just are lost in there and you never find your way out of there. And so I just told her, I said, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. And I just was sitting in the lobby talking to another pastor colleague and he was telling me about what they had to do and they transferred his record from Philadelphia to Oklahoma City. And she said, was well, that what you want me to do? I thought, well, that'd be real nice. And so she got on, put her headset on and got on the phone and you know, and I guess they had to pass her to the person that had my record, you know, and and she said, well, and so I kind of was listening to this conversation. She said, well, the gentleman's sitting right here. She said, obviously, he's not anomalous. Uh, and she was, they talked for a while, and then she came back to me and said, well, the lady in Philadelphia has agreed to reclassify you as real. <laughs> and I thought, Hallelujah. I am real. Thank God. And it got me thinking about identity. And we hear a lot about, a lot of discussion about identity these days. And so in this series, what we want to talk about 
is who do you think you are really? It's an important question because I think in terms of our walk with Christ, how we answer the question will determine how we live. It determines the decisions we make in life, the choices we make, and your mental image of yourself, who you think you are, will either cause you to live a life that's abundant and full, or it will cause you to make choices that are unworthy of who you are. How you see yourself, that mental image, how you answer the question, who do you think you are, will either imprison your life to a life of unsatisfying, unsuccessful kind of path, or empower you to be able to rise above your circumstances, and overcome everything that the world throws against you. Now, we know that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, Paul understood, and he says it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So when you accept Christ, in a sense, everything changes. Your identity changes. Your status with God changes. Your relationship with God changes. Your heart changes. You have a new life. A life worthy of being a new creation. A new opportunity. A new mental picture. A new understanding of who you are. Some of you are familiar with Dr. Neil Anderson and he wrote this as he was talking about this change. Understanding your identity in Christ is absolutely essential to your success as living the Christian life. No person can consistently behave in a way that is inconsistent with the way he or she perceives themselves. Next to a knowledge of God, a knowledge of who you are is by far the most important truth you can possess. So that's what we want to talk about in this, in this series for the next few weeks. And this morning, I want to talk about your identity in Christ forgiven. Next week, we'll talk about another element of what that means to be in Christ. And this morning, we're using this passage in, first, or in, in, in Romans 8, uh, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation... For those who are in Christ Jesus, when you put your faith in Christ, when you came to a real saving relationship with Jesus in your life, and you knew it, and you know it, with God, your status changed from one who was condemned, on the one hand, to forgiven. One changed from lost to found from guilty in your sin to righteousness before God. That's what we're going to talk about next week. Now when we talk about sin, guilt, and forgiveness, there's two problems. Either we feel like that we don't have those issues, that we don't have any problem, any guilt. We never feel guilty. And usually the only people, there's only a few people that feel that way, narcissists, psychopaths, and those who are so self-focused that they can some way Uh, reconstruct their lives in a way that uh, uh, gets them off the hook with guilt. Sometimes even folks in church may think, well, a little religion will be good because if I adopt this philosophy, uh, it's kind of a self-help program and it'll help me get over the humps of life, over the bumps and rough places of life. Uh, And the problem with that is it sets us up and when we really get in a jam, uh, we kind of just skim over the the rough things that we need to deal with in our lives in terms of guilt. But I'm talking about the other side of this this morning. Uh, I may have a message for the people I just talked about, but uh, what I would say just real short about those people is generally they're lost. Someone said lost is hell, okay? Why would I say that? Well, I would say that because in 1 John 1, verse 8, it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Or Romans 3.10 says, There is no one righteous, no, not one. So the Bible 
says and is clear that we all have sinned, right? That we all have fallen short, that we at times are all guilty before God. And so if you've never experienced that, you never felt that way, let me assure you, uh, it's not because you're doing so well. It may be self-deception on your part. Mother Teresa said, the closer you get to stand in the light, the bigger the shadow. The closer you get to God, the more you're, you'll see the darkness within your heart. The closer you get to God, the more you'll see the darkness within your deed. And if you never see the darkness, you never wrestle with it. It's not because you're so close to God, she said. Maybe it's because you're so far away that you don't see yourself in the light of who God is or his call upon your life. So I want to talk for a minute about the other end of the spectrum, though. And that's the people who struggle with guilt, who wrestle with this feeling. They can't really feel free from guilt. Sometimes it's kind of a free-floating, generalized sense of guilt and shame. Other times there is a particular incident in their lives that they can recount that they just can't get over. They can't get over the hump. They can't believe that God could ever forgive them for what they've done. And sometimes they forget this, that Jesus was crucified on the cross so that we can quit crucifying ourselves, right? I'll say it, right. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says he took all of the sins of the world, including yours and mine, upon himself so that your sins could die with him so that you could be resurrected with newness of life. We just celebrated Easter. And one of the re results of Easter was this formation of this resurrected community of people who had all denied him. Some had cursed at him. And yet when he was resurrected, what emerged was this making of this community of people that knew that something had changed for them and in them. And in Romans 8, 1, there is there now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now, condemnation is different than conviction. Conviction is a good thing. Conviction is what the Holy Spirit brings on us. Conviction can be something that we need in our lives from time to time. Conviction sounds like this. Let me give you some uh, ways that it sounds. AC, you blew it. AC, you did wrong. AC, you need to confess that sin. AC, you need to go and ask the person that you offended for forgiveness. AC, you need to go and make what you did right. That's conviction. We hope it's led by the Holy Spirit. Condemnation, on the other hand, is this. AC, you're never going to get it right. AC, you're worthless. AC, you should be ashamed of yourself. AC, how can you even think that you're a Christian when you continue to do the same thing over and over and over again? How could you ever be forgiven? You're such a disappointment. That, listen, that is never the voice of God. That's never the voice of God. Uh, we know that God wants us to be free and alive. So why is it that people who have confessed their sins, who accepted Christ into their lives, why do they still struggle with a sense of guilt. Why is that? I'm going to give you some reasons. And I have to go real fast, okay? I apologize. But that's just the reality. First, some people struggle, struggle with a generalized sense of guilt because of what we call religious abuse. They grew up in a religious community, either by a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or parents, where the gospel or scripture was used in a strict way, it was used to damage you. Maybe they didn't know it was damaging you, but it was more about condemnation in your life 
about not how good you were, not about the grace of God, but about how bad you were and how you could never measure up. Now, I could have you hold hands up and say, how many of you have experienced that? But I won't do that today. But what we understand from the New Testament is God is a God of grace, and God is about lifting us up and setting us free, not putting us down and being critical and judgmental in our lives. The second thing, another reason that is a source of guilt for some people that they've lived with for years is because they grew up in a, in a dysfunctional, condemning family. Now, let me just say this. Not every dysfunctional family is condemning, right? A dysfunctional family is that family where the parents are just more into themselves than they're into their kids. They're more concerned with the pain they're having in their own lives and their behavior of drinking or drugs or sex or their own plans or their career or their work, and they're more focused on that than they are their children. And so they don't intentionally try to hurt their children, as they just don't care. On the other hand, there are dysfunctional families that are shame factories, as they create this sense of shame and blame. It's the way they discipline. It's the way they demean. It's their destructive nature. It's the messages they send, like, the reason our family's in trouble is you. You're the reason that dad or mom left. You're the reason that mom is depressed. You're the reason that nothing ever goes right. You're such a disappointment. When we get those kind of messages from our parents, look, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg talked about this, the way, the perception that children have uh, uh, of us as adults, this adult constraint. It's that we have this kind of, God, we're like a God figure to kids, to our children. We're bigger, we're stronger, and we're supposed to be wiser. Their existence depends on what we provide for them. And so it's very natural when we grow up that we look at our parents as God figures and we take whatever traits that they possess into ourselves and whatever messages they tell us, and then we project those images on our understanding of God. And we think God must feel the same way about us as our moms and dads do. We're a disappointment. Even before your heart changed, let me just say this, we're moving fast. Even before your heart changes in Christ, you can get it in your head that this is not true of you that you're an object of a Father in heaven that loves you maybe more than your Father on earth ever thought of loving you. And you need to be getting that in your head and that image. And maybe that happens before your heart changes. The third reason people feel this sense of guilt is because of perfectionism. Perfectionism is really a way of trying to control our outer world by controlling our inner world Perfectionists think that everything that they do needs to be right and perfect, and the problem is it's not always that way. They want to work so hard that people will admire them. They will respect them because they're so productive, and these tend to be the most successful people. Do you know what city you live in? Edmund, we're performers, right? We're success-driven, aren't we? I mean, maybe this is our story. There's a lot of perfectionism that happens. At the same time, your worth comes from being perfect, and the reality is we never quite come up fully to our own expectations. Your Father in heaven loves you not because... Now, listen, this is the, the counter, the bottom line... Your Father in heaven loves you not because of how you perform, but because of who you are in Christ. You're a child of God. 
and loved of God. The fourth thing, this may be a little bit of a reach for some of you. The fourth reason some people feel this guilt they don't deserve is because of what I think the Scripture calls spiritual warfare. And so I'm going to go on record and tell you this. You ready? As I believe in the devil. What, our senior pastor believes in the devil? Well, let me tell you why. I believe in the devil because Jesus did. And one of the things I think is important for me is to believe what Jesus believed. Okay? Say okay to that. That'll make me feel better. I'm feeling a little guilty. I'm kidding. And I think we need to be faithful to what believe, what Jesus believed in as we try to believe it. And I don't believe in a little guy in a red PJs, you know, suit with a pitchfork and horns. But let me tell you what I do, do believe in. I believe that there's a force in this world, that there is a power, that there is a personal being that Jesus described this way in John 10.10 10, as a thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy everything that's good in your life. The devil. And I think the devil does it in three ways, through deception, temptation, and condemnation. Read Revelation 12.10. The fifth thing that creates guilt, I think, this free-floating guilt, is this. You ready for the big one? Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we, we mess up. And sometimes we get to that place where we've messed up and we have this attitude is there's no way God can forgive me. We have this friend. I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories. We have this friend that uh, she grew up as uh, in a parsonage family. Uh, her dad was a good friend of mine. Uh, she stayed high on drugs and alcohol most of the time. And she was going, driving somewhere on uh, high and went across the center line and hit a man in a pickup truck and killed him, and uh, messed herself up, spent several days in the hospital, and lived in the shame of what she had done. How do we overcome that? I want to share a movie clip with you real quick. It's called Amazing Grace. And it's the story of William Wilberforce, who was... Uh, abolitionist. He advocated in the British Empire for the freedom of slaves and uh, an abolishment of the slave trade and the end of slavery. And there's a scene in the movie, we're going to end with this, uh, where he meets with a good friend of his. Uh, they were good friends in real life. The, ma the, the man's name that he met with was John Newton. Does it, that ring a bell to any of you, John Newton? John Newton was a slave trader. He, uh, he was a captain of a slave ship, many slave ships, and, uh, and he believed that he could never be forgiven for what he had done to others. There's no way that God could forgive him. And he came to the place where he finally was able to accept the forgiveness Christ gave him. He repented of his sins, and he, he realized the evil that he had been involved in and perpetuated, and as a response... John Newton became a minister, and he wrote a song, a hymn. And I'm not going to sing it or just give you the whole song. It's familiar to you. It starts something like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And the clip I'm going to show you is John Newton now as an old man is blind. Let's turn the lights down so they can see it because it's pretty dark. This is my confession. You must use it. Names, ship's records, ports, people. Everything I remember is in here. Although my memory is fading, 
I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner and Christ is a great saviour. You must publish it. Blow a hole in their boat with it. Damn them with it. I wish I could remember all their names. My 20,000 ghosts. They all have names. Beautiful African names. We call them with just grunts. Noises. We were apes. They were humans. <laughs> I being. I couldn't weep till I wrote this. <sighs> I once was blind, but now I see. Didn't I write that too? Yes, you did. Well, now at last it's true. Now go with a go. We've lots of work to do, you and I. The bill passed right before Wilberforce died, but he got to see what his life work had accomplished. I just want to close by reminding you this. We are sinners, every one of us. But we have a great Savior. And that once we're forgiven, if it says, once we're forgiven, we're forgiven. We don't have to keep hanging ourselves on the cross again. God has set us free. If you need that forgiveness, Jesus is here. I want to invite you to respond to whatever need you feel you have in your life today. There's communion at each corner, and there's people in the back that will pray, pray with you if you ask them. We're here. We'll pray with you. Let's stand as we worship and make our response as the Holy Spirit